Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So we are going to wait uh, just five minutes more to wait more people to connect to the webinar and we are going to start. Okay. I can see Dr. Costa Bell. Ignacio? No, not yet. Not yet? To, yes, he's going to appear a little I'm bit here, later. I'm here, but I turned off the camera. Ah, okay. Bueno, mientras vamos esperando que se vayan sumando, este, queremos darles la bienvenida a todos. Este, muchísimas gracias por, por acompañarnos. Este, Vamos a ir comentando un poco cómo va a ser el desarrollo de este, de este webinar, que es un poco diferente al resto. Este, vamos a tener el placer de escucharlo tanto la doctora Proyetti como la doctora Escojone, en dos excelentes presentaciones. Vamos a tener al, al doctor Ignacio Costabé y al doctor Colla como este, moderadores. Y junto al doctor Rajido vamos a ir este, coordinando la, la presentación. Eh, las preguntas, por supuesto, como siempre, las vamos a ir haciendo a través del chat y mm, al final este, vamos a comentarles un poco, junto con el doctor Rajiro, cuál va a ser nuestra próxima, nuestra próximo meeting. Okay. Esperamos un poco más, Cintia. Sí, unos tres minutitos más y vamos a, unos tres minutitos más vamos a esperar antes bueno. de comenzar. Gracias, Quintia. Sin ella esto no podría ser posible. A través de Lumenis, por supuesto. Muchísimas gracias. De nada, doctor. Con todo gusto. Muchísimas gracias. Vamos a ver acá. Justamente hoy estaba hablando con Quintia, resaltando toda la tarea que ha hecho para para llevar esto a cabo, que realmente es enorme, ¿no? Uh -huh. Toda una tarea de coordinación, de tenernos paciencia a los neófitos en, en, en estos sistemas. <risa> La verdad que muy agradecido. Con todo gusto, doctor. Muchas gracias por sus palabras. Doctor Proyecto, doctor Stofoni, thank you for to wait. Thank you so much for your kind invitation. For me, it's it's a great pleasure to be here today with you. So thank you so much. I, I am very very proud to be here because I I like I love uh, Argentina and I was I was. Uh, one one summer in uh, one no, summer one one winter four or five years ago for two congresses uh, and uh, was was a really good I have a very good friend uh, down there and uh, is uh, is always is always good to try to share the experience and I think that uh, we can uh, we can learn uh, each other and uh, this is uh, very important we have a completely other mentality from the our old mm -hmm. uh, old. Uh, all the proctor, uh, all directors, and I think that uh, 
this is uh, the base of uh, of our uh, didactic uh, um, way to do to do the the the, the surgery so I think that uh, sharing uh, the different experience uh, can improve uh, the knowledge of everyone. Everyone, and uh, I am very convinced that uh, also for uh, for us, that is now it's third, more than thirty years that uh, we are doing this. Uh, every day we try we try to learn something new, and uh, I think that this is uh, the the best for for a surgeon and uh, also for the patient for our patient. Mm -hmm. It's also important that uh, people uh, young like Sylvia now is uh, giving uh, to the urological world uh, a lot of uh, news uh, on flexible ureteroscopy mm -hmm. and uh, i think that uh, is uh, is really is really good uh, to stay in this uh, urological uh, global world because uh, you can have a new idea and you can you can uh, you can uh, share the ideas and also you can have a new idea because uh, is uh, if you have only your eyes is not uh, is not the way to do it there is also share share everything with father is uh, is very good so thank you very much and we try to do our best thank you thank so you. much uh, thank, thank you thank you so we can start dr Rengio, okay. if you want to do the yes. presentation yes well uh, i'm ruben Benjio from argentina i'm the president of uh, Argentinian Federation of Urology, uh, and I really appreciate the great effort that uh, all my partners are doing to uh, take uh, in advance this this event. Uh, and especially, I want to thank again uh, Akintia for the coordination and their support, that her support, uh, and uh, well. Uh, this is, is a, a, a medium to to share our, the experience of qual very qualified uh, urologists around the world, and here we, we have uh, Silvia Proietti and Cesare Escofone that will allow us uh, to to learn something more about different techniques in Europe. Uh, well, uh, Kintia. I give you the word if you can explain how this uh, event it, it will uh, progress so uh, all of us can can know how how to do it. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much everybody for joining us on this webinar. It's a pleasure for us to have this wonderful doctor here for sharing his their experience with ours. And um, so we as Luminis are supporting the transmission of these webinars, but all the content uh, was preparing for the doctors. So just to remain all the audience that you had on the right of your screen, um, a box of questions you can, you can write in Spanish or English, and we are going to translate the questions for the doctors at the end of each presentation. Dr. Scafoni is going to start the presentation and then Dr. Proietti. Um, you also have a document with all the, the information of our distributor around Latin America if you want to contact with us. So I am going to turn off my camera so all the rest of the doctor can join us. Thank you so much. Gracias, Quintia. Eh, para nosotros es un honor este, tenerlos al doctor César Escofone, a la doctora Silvia Proietti este, con nosotros. Y, y la verdad que estamos preparados para disfrutar dos excelentes exposiciones que van a estar coordinadas por el doctor Raúl Colla y el doctor Ignacio Costabel. El doctor César Escofone, que es el jefe del Departamento de Urología del Hospital este, Cotolengo en Torino y la doctora Silvia Proietti que trabaja, se desempeña como urologa en el Hospital San Rafael de Turro, en la división de, de, del hospital en Milán, Italia y a su vez es vicedirectora del European Training Center for Neurology, como bien lo dijo el doctor Scofone. Eh, doctora Proietti, doctor Scofone, este, thank you so much again for participate in this webinar. It's an honor for us 
and we are prepared to to enjoy your presentation. So, if the, um, Dr. Scopone, is, if you want to, you, you can start whatever you want. Okay. So thank you very much for the invitation, and I'm very, very, very uh, happy to uh, to be here to share to share uh, my experience on the. Sorry, but to share my experience on uh, the totally unblock uh, olmium laser enucleation uh, of the prostate. I uh, I started uh, seven or eight years ago to do just one second because I have a problem with the screen. Sorry, just one second because I can't see my slide. Just one second. I don't know the reason. Everything was okay before. I so doctor, we are we are seeing your screen. So maybe yes, but uh, but I have the problem because I have uh, all uh, the camera of the others in my screen. So now I can start. Uh, okay, I can see because. Uh, okay, perfect. So you can see my screen. Yes. 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 Okay. So uh, when when uh, uh, we start uh, we start to do uh, BPH surgery, we had uh, really a lot of different uh, different options, and. Uh, uh, in the last in the last seven eight years, uh, I try to uh, do my best to start the all new laser enucleation, and I think that uh, after uh, eight years now, I am really convinced that uh, I follow the the right way uh, for the BPH treatment because as, as you consider the guidelines of the EAU of the AUA, the all new laser enucleation or the laser enucleation is uh, one uh, of uh, the option that uh, you can consider for every kind uh, of uh, prostate uh, from the small to the very very large uh, prostate and uh, in bph treatment uh, if you consider the um, the uh, different uh, the different option you can you can consider qrp for uh, the moment for sure the the best uh, treatment uh, for the resection, green light is for sure for vaporization the best uh, the best uh, laser energy, and for the nucleation OLEP and tulium is for sure the best uh, the best option. But what is the difference uh, between uh, between uh, uh, resection or ablation and anatomical nucleation? The difference is that uh, in uh, anatomical uh, enucleation, uh, you start uh, from the border of the prostate. So you uh, do what uh, you did uh, in uh, open surgery. You start from the border and uh, you try to remove all the prostate uh, and uh, put the prostate uh, in the bladder differently from uh, uh, vaporization or resection, in which you start from uh, the, the, the medial part of the prostate, uh, trying to arrive uh, to the capsule. And uh, this is also the reason that uh, the learning curve of the endoscopic anatomical enucleation is considered uh, uh, more difficult than, uh, than the TRP or vaporization, but because we have to start for the best treatment so we have to remove all all the prostate so this is this is a, a real important so at the end we have the complete removal of the of the adenoma so we do what we did in open surgery okay and we can do this with laser olmium tulium green light dyed laser Tulium fiber laser, but uh, we can do this also with uh, other kind of energy, more simple or more uh, cost-effective energy like monopolar, bipolar, or plasma. And uh, what uh, we consider in our experience is that uh, 
OLEP, in our experience, is for sure uh, the best way to do, and uh, is based on the physical characteristic of the Olmium, and we uh, tried uh, in our uh, uh, technique evolution to optimize uh, the energy of this kind of laser, based on the fact that uh, we are convinced that enucleation is the most important way to treat uh, the adenoma. And uh, if uh, you consider anatomical enucleation, the concept is the complete removal of the transitional zone with a complete disobstruction of, uh, of the urethra and trying to avoid all the complications of the simple prostatectomy, decreasing the, the bleeding and also the wound healing, and trying to maintain the peripheral zone of the, of the prostate uh, not, uh, uh, not irritated by the energy. So trying to decrease this uh, irritation in order to maintain the erectile function and trying to uh, increase the speed of uh, the recovery of the prostatic uh, fossa and uh, on the other side uh, decrease uh, the permanent stress uh, urinary incontinence. What is very important uh, in uh, before before starting one enucleation is uh, to know the kind of prostate that uh, we have to face and for this is very important uh, for example, all the, uh, in a normal ultrasound, an abdominal ultrasound, but we have a lot of, a lot of patients now with the um, RMI, and we can consider to see the shape and the relationship of the prostate with the bladder neck, with uh, the urethra, understanding the different shape of the prostate, because the prostate can have different shape, different uh, protrusion inside into the bladder and we have to know before starting the, um, uh, the surgery. And for this, uh, we developed two different techniques. One is was the partially in block that we published in the end of 2015 on World Journal on the Endurology. And now we arrive to the totally in block olmium laser enucleation. And uh, we try to develop uh, different concepts. One concept is uh, the concept of the low power approach. Now we are using 40 watts for, uh, for uh, the enucleation and uh, also we are developed the no touch approach. So we try to use the photomechanical effect of the plasma, uh, the plasma bubble or uh, the bubble that uh, is created on the tip of the laser fiber in order to divide to divide the, the plan between the capsula and the, uh, and the adenoma. So we had a lot of different techniques, the three lobe technique, the two or one lobe technique, the partial in block, the totally in block uh, technique. And this uh, is the evolution of the technique. And uh, in my experience, uh, when I started, uh, when I started uh, to, to do this, uh, uh, this uh, this technique, I uh, had a lot of very 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 important problem, and one of the most important problem is to find the right plane. And in the three lobe, you have to find the, the right plane in three different places: five, seven, and twelve o'clock. And uh, was difficult to understand how to maintain the correct map. It also was also Dif difficult to to uh, to do a, a good hemostasis on the on the peripheral part of the of the adenoma and uh, <clears throat> what was really difficult was to try to uh, avoid the uh, damage of the sphincter and imagine that when you are doing an endoscopic recreation the most important damage is not a direct damage of the sphincter, but is the movement of your straight instrument on the sphincter. Take care when you do this and try to uh, move your instrument medially. Avoid to push your adenoma toward the bladder next if you have 
your uh, um, sphincter already attached to to the adenoma and uh, and uh, all the these uh, all these uh, all these um, sorry okay just one second all these uh, all these um, difficulties uh, give me the suggestion to try to change something and uh, the suggestion was to uh, to uh, arrive in the end block no touch uh, technique and uh, the 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 first uh, step of the end block uh, was uh, to create uh, this uh, complete removal of the adenoma with only an incision at five o'clock and uh, when uh, we start uh, and uh, these are the result of the of the three lobe technique and if you take care to this, you see we have 43 grams of adenoma with 0.7 enucleation efficiency. So, and using 156 kilojoules for each procedure. And if we consider the changing with the end block with the same weight of the prostate, we start to have and uh, efficiency from one grams uh, after three years uh, to 1.8 grams uh, for minute of enucleation efficiency, decreasing at 85 kilojoules per procedure. So the, the energy that you use during the, the enucleation is a very important uh, information and uh, able to tell you, okay, you are increasing your uh, ability in uh, in the nucleation, decreasing the um, the energy that you employed. The concept of no touch con concept, the, the no touch concept, is uh, try to use not touching the tissue, not burning the tissue, maintaining this white aspect of the tissue and decreasing in this way also the thermal energy of uh, the of uh, of the laser so the result is a less post operative dysuria and the concept is very 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 easy to understand if you know the physical characteristic of the laser if you stay attached you have you can create an ablation incision but you have a, a thermal damage of the tissue if you use this this bubble on the tip, you can divide without no tissue effect. If you stay, if you stay more than five millimeters, so the perfect uh, the perfect uh, uh, distance uh, during the enucleation is around two millimeter because this distance can allow you to decrease the thermal damage on the tissue. Is not really only two millimeter, but sometimes uh, you can have a, a damage deeper in 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 the tissue. So when when we consider this uh, plasma bubble, uh, is uh, Dr. Cecchetti from Padua, the first one who proposed the, this, was was um, was uh, attached by other other specialist, German specialist, because they. So saying that uh, possible to have uh, 1,500 degrees, uh, and uh, this is the temperature in which you create uh, the plasma. So, but at the end, uh, we don't uh, we don't worry about this uh, because uh, if. Uh, Sembra che il tempo sarà bello in Italia oggi. La temperatura oh. raggiungerà 15 gradi. Uh, the, the <laughs> I have some uh, some interference with the meteo, and. Uh, uh if uh, what is very important is uh, the, uh, the the this plasma this plasma bubble or vapor bubble is not uh, important what is important is uh, the clinical effect of this uh, of this uh, bubble so when you want to use in the no touch uh, way you have to stay two millimeter okay 
So in not important plasma or vapor, it's a bubble. It's a bubble expansion, it's a photomechanical effect, and we have to uh, use this. Low power issue, imagine that uh, I, uh, I had my, uh, my um, change in the, in the power using the P120 or luminis, but unfortunately during an nucleation, I used the, the, the right pedal of this using 60 watts. And at the end was very, very good enucleation. So I started to change the, the setting and now I am using two joule and 20 hertz. And this is more than enough to do an enucleation because when you use the real enucleation, not cutting, you have to divide the space and not cutting the space like you can see in this, uh, in this uh, slide. So another issue, important issue is uh, this post op uh, dysuria. And uh, when uh, you give more than 100 kilojoule is demonstrated by the digital tool that you have more, more uh, symptoms, more irritative symptoms. And uh, with uh, also the, in the very small or very large adenoma and with low efficiency, you can increase uh, these, uh, these uh, symptoms so we try to arrive to have the right uh, potency the right energy given to the patient and the most uh, uh, efficient way to do the, the laser so at the end what is important is to have a good a good maturation but we have to uh, be very very uh, careful about uh, the incontinence and especially uh, with uh, the uh, in the sphincteric urinary incompetence that we can have after the um, the surgery so these are some results that uh, we we uh, we presented the DAU and the AUA in 2017 in which we demonstrated that low power did de decrease the percentage of irritative symptoms but uh, decrease the intensity and the length of these of these symptoms so less is better than more but we had some problem with some patient with this uh, sphincteric urinary incompetence even if we take care to the movement of the instrumentation and if you consider the uh, the anatomy you can see the most important characteristic of the sphincter is that at 12 o'clock, the sphincter is one centimeter uh, more forward, uh, toward more toward the, the bladder neck. So the incision of the sphincteric mucosa on the adenoma should be done a little bit oblique toward the bladder necks. And uh, <clears throat> this is very important because in the first technique, we leave the sphincteric mucosa from, from nine to three o'clock attached till the end. And uh, this, uh, I think, could, uh, sh could be one of the of the the problem to for uh, for this uh, sphincteric uh, incompetence that we can have for one, two weeks, uh, two, three months sometimes. But what is important is the moment of your receptoscope, your your uh, laser 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 working element, and and trying to uh, avoid the traction of the sphincter during uh, the nucleation with a correct handling and uh, with uh, Felipe Fideredo we uh, made some changes in our technique and we pass to the totally en bloc no touch olmium laser nucleation and one of the base of this uh, of this technique is the first incision of the mucosa all around the adenoma just close to the apex in this way if this is the first step of your surgery you detach completely the adenoma from the sphincter and the sphincter is not uh, is not uh, uh, didn't have traction in during all your surgery and uh, when we present in WC in Paris in 2018 the result of our our new 
uh, technique, we demonstrated that with this uh, change in, uh, in the um, technique, we can decrease the intensity and the duration of the post-operative dysuria and also the incidence of uh, this uh, uh, transient sphinteric uh, urinary incompetence. As you can see here, in the partially en bloc and uh, in the totally en bloc, uh, we have less uh, transient sphinteric urinary incompetence uh, in the totally en bloc uh, holmium laser enucleation. And uh, also a decrease, uh, a, a further decrease uh, in the disorder. So now I want to uh, show you one uh, video. And the video is a 10, 10 minutes video. I, I think that, uh, can you see my video? Uh, you see my video? Yes, yes, doctor. Are you seeing the video? Okay. Yes. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, the video of the nucleation. This is the prostate. Prostate is uh, 80 grams uh, prostate. And uh, first uh, we have to evaluate the uh, adenoma. If it's possible, we can check also the orifices. But uh, if it's not possible, I don't want to force because if you to push, uh, if you push the, the, the middle lobe, you can, uh, you can, uh, um, you can uh, make uh, some bleeding. And it's very important uh, to have a very good view during the surgery, okay? First step is the incision around the Vero Montano from, uh, from uh, right to the other, to the left side. And in this case, pushing a little bit laterally the adenoma, you can find immediately the, the right plan. You can see the right plan is this plan. This is a little bit translucent and pushing a little bit you are using the energy of the laser with this uh, bubble in on the tip and pushing a little bit. But with the Olmium laser, what uh, I am I am convinced is that you are using a lot of energy-driven enucleation, not blunt dissection, differently from uh, green light or bipolar or uh, other technique. And uh, you are using this uh, this uh, bubble. And as you can see here, you see the, the energy and you see this, uh, this uh, whitening effect uh, on the tissue. And if you have some uh, bleeders, some artery, you can, you can, uh, you can uh, coagulate. This is the incision of the mucosa. And for the incision of the mucosa, you have to stay not uh, just close to the sphincter, but leaving uh, one centimeter of uh, this mucosa and arriving till 12 o'clock. And this is the first step of the, of the surgery. The same you have to do also in the other side, connecting the two incision. And when we, we connect the two incision, we finish to detach the apex of the prostate going around the epic, pushing a little bit, and arriving at 12 o'clock, where normally we find, we find uh, a piece of mucosa attached at 12 o'clock that we have to cut transversely. Okay, we are nine o'clock on the other side now, and trying to arrive also on the other side at the apex at 12 o'clock. So in this way, we try to cut all the mucosa attached and as you can see now we can go around the prostate so we finish our detachment so from now till the end of the surgery we don't have any any uh, traction on the sphincter so and when you detach completely you can go around the prostate like a finger like a finger in open surgery and it's very easy to arrive to the bladder neck. And when you, with the endoscope, you have to push 
a little bit uh, always uh, medially. Now we are doing uh, the inferior part and we are pushing up the adenoma. If you stay laterally, you have to push uh, medially the adenoma. If you stay on the on the dome of the of the adenoma, you have to push it down. And what is very important is arrive to the bladder neck, and normally you have to open the bladder neck. The best place to open the bladder neck is 12 o'clock. And you have to also to know that is that the prostate is not like a cube, but is like an egg. So when you arrive to the bladder neck, you have to go a little bit downwards because because you don't have to undermine the you can see here this is a very important step you open the bladder here okay these are the circular fiber of the bladder neck you open and you are a very important reference for for your your surgery because now you you follow the you can follow the the bladder neck and the coagulating these are some of the flock arteries that you can find, and having a, having a reference under the under the prostate on the bladder neck, you follow and you incise you incise the 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 mucosa of the bladder neck. Coming back on the other side, you do the same. These are the 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 circular fiber you can see here, and you can cut these fibers and you try to arrive around seven and five o'clock just beside the adenoma and this is one of the most important step because when you arrive here you have to come back under the adenoma and knowing that you have to go upwards because if you go straight in this step you can undermine the bladder neck and arriving directly under the the two 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 uh, ureteral orifices so in this case you can you try to uh, make uh, slimmer this part and pushing up uh, the adenoma going up is uh, is very important to going uh, to going uh, up so don't uh, do this uh, but arrive in this uh, in this place uh, and uh, slowly you arrive uh, just close to a uh, incision that you made uh, on the bladder neck uh, and uh, you completely detach uh, the prostate and uh, what is the the real advantage the real advantage for sure is uh, in terms of timing now we are doing a prostate with in a prostate of 50 grams in 20 25 minutes and big prostate we have an efficiency of till 2.8 to 3 grams a minute means that the prostate of 150 grams is around 50 minutes one hour of enucleation so i think that if you compare this with the three lob is really really faster but what is the main advantage uh, in my opinion is that you can follow the plan better than in uh, the three log technique you have only one place is around the vero montanum to find uh, the plan and if you maintain the plan it's very easy to uh, to finish uh, to finish this surgery and but the concept of the early detachment is one of the most important concepts that uh, uh, we have to do because uh, because of the incontinence because incontinence or uh, incompetence of the sphincteric uh, the the urinary sphincteric uh, sphincter you uh, this is the most important problem so if uh, you avoid this uh, is uh, is really is really important for you and especially for the patient but Another important uh, thing is uh, that you have to discuss with the patient and you can't avoid with this uh, kind of uh, surgery the the urge incontinence. So if uh, you have a patient with uh, an uh, instability or uh, hyperactivity of the trusor, this patient could have uh, could have this uh, 
incontinence uh, and uh, you have to wait and uh, to give some anti-muscarinic uh, drugs uh, to uh, avoid this. When uh, you, uh, you arrive in the bladder, you have to morselate and for more dilation is uh, uh, one of the steps in which uh, you have to, um, to take care because uh, especially when you have a big prostate, you are a little bit tired, but uh, we have, we have some, uh, some tricks uh, in maintaining uh, the, the bladder completely full, uh, maintaining the, the probe of the, the, of the, of the morselator into the, into the center of the bladder. And at the end, you can have to check always the uh, orifices. This is the sphincter. Always I check the sphincter at the end because it's very important to see the sphincter closing in front of you. If the sphincter is not closing in front of you, it's not good. So take care to this and check the sphincter at the end because this is very, very important. So thank you very much. Okay, doctor, thank you so much. So, Dr. Raul, you can read the questions. Yes, thank you, doctor. Very yes. nice your presentation. I want your practice and didactic. I have enjoyed your presentation. I have a question for you. When yes. you have an important bleeding, what technique do you, do you employ to control it? Do you change the intensity of laser or you shoot from further distance? Important bleeding normally, normally, if you have an important artery bleeding, you have to find the artery because if you have experience with the laser, it's totally different from a bipolar or monopolar. You have to find the artery and to coagulate, not directly on the artery, but laterally in order to close the artery. Because, and it doesn't matter if you increase the, the, the energy of the laser or at the power of the laser because uh, is, uh, is not, uh, is not uh, useful for uh, coagulating. So the best way to avoid the bleeding is to avoid the bleeding when you start. So don't be in hurry. And if you have artery, you have to coagulate immediately. If the, the bleeding is very, very, very important, sometimes, uh, not a lot of times, you can, you can coagulate also with bipolar. I have always my bipolar electrode in uh, on my table, so it's the same working element. And uh, if uh, I need uh, to coagulate something at the end, I use for two three minutes the bipolar, and I use also the bipolar to check the orifices, to check the sphincter, to check if I leave uh, or, I, or I left the some pieces into the into the fossa because sometimes. With the 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 morselator, you can't see very well the fossa, and so it's important to move all the cross in order to avoid the uh, leaving one piece of prostate in the in the prostatic fossa because this is not not good because you have to reoperate the patient. Thank you, doctor. The next question is the doctor Rodrigo Juaneda of Cordoba City, Argentina. Is what tips? Well, you suggest so to reduce the risk of the ureter stricture. You understand? It is, yes, yes. This is one important uh, question because, unfortunately, we are using now, I think, uh, two uh, two big instrument, and we are working with 24, 20, 26, and I think that uh, this is the most important uh, reason of the ureter stricture because with the laser you don't have any transmission of energy. On the sheet so the reason is that you are using big big sheet i think that sometimes it's not possible to entry the urethra i think it could be also good like for the ureter to put a catheter and to come back in uh, in two three days and the, the situation also of the urethra in the normal urethra not a pathological structure in two three days the urethra is uh, is uh, is a more uh, compliant to your instrument. Yes. The next question is the Diego Santillan, the Argentina. Sorry.
Yes, uh, I'm, I'm going to read it. What is the maximum size of prostates yeah. that you will do, uh, that you perform with Holly? The maximum I size. Uh, I didn't do one open surgery in the last seven years. So I did all the, and the maximum that I had is, was 280 grams. And that this is the maximum that I had. But uh, I think that uh, perhaps uh, I, uh, I try to do in two steps. Uh, but uh, I am doing uh, the endoscopic enucleation, not uh, open surgery. Okay, doctor. And there are there are many comments that saying congratulations, excellent presentation from Dr. Mateus Esquetino. And there are another question from uh, Julian Valero. How many procedures do you need to accomplish in order to become an acceptable surgeon? It depends on the on the the way that you uh, you uh, you you learn. I think that it's very important to see a lot of videos before. Stay just beside ten procedure with a, a good a good enucleator, and after this, I think that around thirty. It depends also on the skill of the of the surgeon, but I think that thirty could be. A, a good uh, a good median uh, between 20 and 40 some somebody could be in 20 20 20 nucleation uh, could be uh, could reach uh, a good level i think that is important to uh, to try to do this and uh, not uh, be afraid to change to bipolar when you start i remember that when i started with the three lobe technique sometimes uh, my my scrub nurse didn't want uh, to, uh, to scrub with me because uh, I had uh, three hours of operation for a 50, 60 grams uh, prostate. But uh, this, is, uh, this was due to the, to, the, to, the, to the technique. With this technique, I think that could be very, a little bit uh, easier than, uh, than the three lobe technique. The more difficult step is the first step, the incision of the urethra. And uh, another, another important step uh step is to, to do many procedures in a short time so don't do one olep or two olep a month but when you start put one two three patient a week because you maintain your your training if you do one one procedure a month you have to restart again always so try to put many patients i think that would be also in one department to be two surgeons together to start in order to help each other and don't have to don't have also some uh, some some problem so you can you can manage you can correct each other and i think that could be also fine to uh, to try to to maintain the link with your proctor and asking to your proctor to stay, for example, also with the web, also not directly in the OR, but to correct during the, the first 10, 15 surgeries. Can you repeat the intensity of the laser, doctor, please? Intensity of the laser? Uh, the, setting. the setting is around two joules for energy, 20 hertz, and long pulse length. This is what I'm using for everything, for coagulation, enucleation, and whatever you want. In the real enucleation, you don't need to cut because if we are using 100 watts, 120 watts, we make olmium more, more similar to tulium. So, and it's completely different. Olmium is a, a more gentle, more gentle laser than tulium. And if you see the enucleation with volume, you see the tissue is always white. It's not brownish. It's not carbonized. Mm -hmm. So this is yeah. a thing that we have to know all the different uh, different energies that uh, we have and uh, trying to try to keep from each uh, different laser the, 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 the best. I, I, uh, I am convinced that uh, we have to use less energy that uh, we need. Uh, less energy that uh, the, the 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 more energy the 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 right quantity of energy regarding your needing. So if uh, I can do 
a nucleation with 40 watts, I have to do a nucleation with 40 watts and not with 100 watts. Now we are a mean um, a quantity of energy around 45 kilojoule for a, a prostate of 40, 50 grams. So this is uh, as less than half uh, that the normal quantity of energy given in the literature for the three lobe technique. But this is is evident because the three lobe technique you have to cut, cut, and cut, and after you enucleate. But this cutting need a lot of energy, need 100 watts for uh, for cutting. And doctor, okay. why, why is the time? What is the time of the procedure using that settings? on the laser what is the total time the total time is yeah. now is 85 uh, percent of the enucleation time okay so and uh, this is one no this is a good question because i underlined this is one parameter to see if you are you are you are uh, improving your uh, your ability because uh, when you have uh, uh 20 percent uh, of time of lasering and uh, uh, you have five minutes of lasering and uh, 20 minutes of uh, enucleation is not good. When the, the, the two times uh, are very similar, it means that you are using good your laser. Okay. How many, how many holeps do you do in the week and which is the learning curve? Uh, yeah. The learning curve, I, I told you, is about, I think, 30. 30, 30 procedure is enough. Uh, in our department, uh, we are making uh, from two to 10, 10 OLEP, because OLEP, uh, we, with OLEP, uh, we, uh, we cover all the OR. If we have a lot of oncological surgery, we have uh, we decrease the number of OLEP. If we don't have, we can do three or four OLEP in a, in a morning. Okay. And then we are, now we arrive around 750, all up uh, done with the two different technique the block and the total block. okay okay doctor okay, okay doctor there are, there, are, there are another question from dr diego belisle this is the last question doctor what technique do you use in case you need to preserve the anti-grade ejaculation in a young patient this is a, this is a really a good issue and uh, and is uh, an important issue today. I think that uh, when uh, we consider to maintain the, the ejaculation, uh, we have to balance uh, the disobstruction. Okay, if you want to maintain the ejaculation, uh, I think that uh, you have to consider to maintain uh, some tissue around uh, the verum montanum. I have a a very very good good results uh, with the incision of the prostate so in a very small prostate or in the marion disease but also in very small prostate you can consider also the incision of the prostate and not uh, the total enucleation imagine if you do the total enucleation of the prostate even if you preserve the bladder neck you have uh, the retrograde ejaculation for sure if you maintain some tissue around the risk is that uh, this tissue can obstruct uh, the patient. So I think that uh, I am very, very clear with the patient. I discuss uh, everything with the patient and perhaps uh, with uh, people, uh, with a patient uh, wanting to maintain ejaculation, I can change the, the, the procedure. I can go to Zoom, I can go to Eurolift, uh, I can go to other, <laughs> not, uh, not uh, permanent with the result, but maintaining for one, two, three years the ejaculation to the patient. Okay, thank you so thank much, you. Doctor. I am going thank to give. Thank you so um, much, Doctor Cesar. Thank you, thank you. Cesar. Thank you. Excellent presentation, right? It's very didactic. Huh? Uh, thank you so much and congratulations. Congratulations, uh, Doctor. Here. Thank you very much. I I yeah, stay yeah, with yeah. you. I stand with Sylvia. Okay. Yes. 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 And I am giving the permission. Yes. Now, now are you seeing okay. your screen, Doctor Proietti? Yes. The presentations Perfect. will be given by Dr. Proietti and um, moderated by Dr. Ignacio Costabel. Silvia, is you there? 
Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes. So, dear yes, colleagues, Ignacio? Yes. Can you hear? We can hear you yes. and we can see you all. Okay. 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 Dear colleagues, uh, good, af good afternoon. Thanks again for this kind invitation. Uh, I would like uh, to, uh, before starting uh, about complex cases in endourology, to congratulate uh, with the Cesare with the very nice uh, presentation and very didactic uh, lesson. Thank you so much, Cesare. So let's talk now about complex cases in endourology, and uh, I would like to share with you some um, uh, some cases. The first cases uh, are about uh, calcified stent. So the first case is 24 years uh, um, male, BMI is 22. He, this guy has the left double J urethral stent uh, since 10 years. Uh, with multiple bilateral renal stones, and uh, it was uh, completely asymptomatic when it came uh, to our attention. He underwent uh, left uh, ureteroscopy 10 years ago in another hospital, and then for a calcified double J stent on the left side, he underwent several uh, ESWL. So this is the case. Uh, as you can see, this poor guy, has a, a very calcified stent on the left side and with multiple renal stone uh, on both sides. Uh, so what do you do in this case? Uh, ESWL, flexible ureteroscopy, PCNL, endoscopic combined approach, uh, simultaneous bilateral endoscopic surgery. You start with the left side, right side. So we decide to perform uh, a left uh, ECIRS, uh, just not because uh, Cesare is with us uh, and with uh, Cecilia Cracco, they are the inventor of this very nice procedure, but because in our opinion was the best choice for this guy. So you can see on the, uh, on the video, the distal part of the calcified stent uh, in the bladder. And you have to remind that the laser can cut everything. So we started to, uh, to cut the uh, distal part of the double J stent. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, we perform a percutaneous access uh, on the left side in order to perform a lithotripsy of the proximal part of the double J stent. So um, this, is the, um, uh, this is my mentor Guido Giusti and uh, this is my, uh, me. On the, um, on the flexible ureteroscopy part. And uh, in the meantime, while Guido was performing the PCNL on the proximal part of the double J stent, I started with the um, uh, ureteroscopy, uh, cutting piece by piece uh, the double J stent that was completely uh, calcified, as you can see. So we started to cut piece by piece uh, the double J stent in the ureter because we didn't know if uh, we were able to remove uh, the stent uh, just from the PCNL axis. But uh, uh, honestly, at the end, the ureter was very compliant and uh, we were able without uh, uh, pulling the, the stent to, to remove uh, all the stent from the PCNL axis. And this is the stent at the end of the uh, of the bed, of the battle, and uh, you can see that uh, the distal part of the double J stent uh, was completely cut by using the laser in the into the bladder, and the other part was uh, removed by uh, the P, uh, the percutaneous, percutaneous axis. Uh, so this is a, a similar case, even though the management was uh, a little bit different. Uh, he, he is uh, 40 years uh, uh, male. Uh, he underwent a previous bilateral double J stent for bilateral renal stones uh, in another uh, renal colleagues in another hospital. And the patient was lost to the follow up. Uh, um, sorry. Uh, the patient was lost to the follow-up and the bilateral double J stent were in place since four years. And he came to our attention with the calcified bilateral double J stent and bilateral renal stone. And this is the, 
uh, this is the CT scan uh, of this other patient and uh, you can see that the uh, double J stent on the left side was more calcified than the other side and uh, you can see that the calcification was in particular in the UPJ and uh, in, um, in the lower calyx, uh, calyx on the left side was uh, uh, present a lot of uh, stones uh, so mm, too big uh, too big for removing by using the flexible ureter uh, ureteroscopy so we decide again to perform a combined approach uh, in this guy on the left side I, uh, I put in slides also the CT scan with the medium contrast just to show you that the, C the double J stent was present in the upper calyx and the uh, majority of the stones were present in the lower calyx. Um, and uh, just to show you that the angle between the upper calyx and the lower calyx was very accurate even though we uh, demonstrate uh, with our friend Mario Sofer from Israel that in supine position it is possible to reach the upper calyx in 80% of cases compared to the uh, prone position uh, where is it uh, where, uh, where is it possible in only 20% of cases in this case uh, uh, it was not possible to reach the upper calyx so the best solution was again to perform a combined approach and uh, uh, I started to check uh, inside the bladder again the uh, double J stent uh, and uh, they were less calcified than the previous guy but anyway they they were calcified enough but uh, I want to show you that the ureter was uh, compliant enough so I placed the uh, the guide wire in order to reach the upper urinary tract and then I decide to backload the uh, single user ureteroscope this is the little view by Boston Scientific uh, in order to check the ureter and the situation before performing the uh, PCNL access so I enter inside the ureter and uh, I, find, I found this stone into the ureter and uh, I in, uh, started to, uh, to perform a lithotripsy of this stone uh, with the Olmu laser, as you can see. So the ureter was really compliant because you see how much is big the ureter. And uh, the, um, um, I was uh, able to perform the lithotripsy just by using the flexible ureteroscope inside the ureter. And, uh, and then I reached the uh, upper calyx where the, also the proximal part of the, uh, of the double J stent was really calcified. So I started to perform uh, a lithotripsy also the, of the proximal part of the double J stent while uh, my mentor started uh, with the um, percutaneous access. Uh, you see how much uh, in the pilography, how much is long and narrow the uh, infundibulum of the uh, upper calyx and uh, is really accurate the angle between the lower calyx and the upper calyx. And so we decide to puncture the uh, lower calyx, as you can see, and uh, uh, in supine position, if you are in uh, the uh, medium contrast, so the urine uh, is coming out uh, without any problem. So we perform the balloon dilation, as you can see, uh, in, uh, um, with the balloon, uh, and uh, we inflate the balloon, and then we push and twist the ampla sheet uh, inside the kidney. In the meantime, I was carry, I carried uh, on with the lithotripsy and to check the double J stent in order to be sure that we were able to to uh, remove the double J stent from the PCNL access. Uh, so, as I told you, we push and twist the ampla sheets and uh, shift, and uh, and then we enter inside the the kidney with the nephroscope. So we found the stone that uh, there were uric acid stone in the lower calyx. So it started with a lithotripsy, uh, with a lithotripsy, and uh, they remove. Uh, we remove uh, the uh, the stones from the lower calyx. 
So at the, at the end of the lithotripsy, uh, we try to remove uh, the double J stent. Uh, I thought that uh, the lithotripsy was enough uh, uh, of the double J stent, but uh, um, uh, but um, honestly, uh, the um, uh, we were not able to remove all the stents. Uh, from the percutaneous axis, uh, and uh, I carry it uh, on with the lithotripsy uh, with the double J stent. And uh, you see from the percutaneous axis, uh, it was not possible to reach the, uh, the upper calyx, and just the proximal part of the stent was uh, uh, outside the patient. So at the end, uh, anyway, the, the ureter was compliant enough uh, and the double J was completely uh, removed from the calcification. So we removed from the uh, urethra the double J stent. And so we carry on with, uh, with the lithotripsy of the, uh, the stones left uh, in the upper calyx. Uh, and uh, we use the technique, uh, pass the ball technique. Uh, so I, um, I remove uh, by using the, the basket uh, from the upper calyx of uh, this stone. And then uh, as you can see in the other video, uh, Guido remove uh, just using uh, another uh, grasper the, uh, the stone that uh, uh, I, um, I, uh, I remove uh, by using the, uh, the basket. And we uh, carry on with the uh, technique of pass the ball technique. It's very use, uh, useful in order not to perform another access. Uh, also because in this particular case, the upper calyx, even though it is possible in supine position, it was very high. And by using the flexible ureteroscope, you can avoid uh, in the majority of the situation the, um, uh, to perform uh, another access uh, into the kidney, uh, into the kidney. So, um, this is vid this, this video just to show you that when you perform uh, mini PCNL, mini uh, combined approach, uh, and you are using the flexible ureteroscope, the reusable one, and uh, you don't uh, pay attention uh, in entering inside the kidney, and uh, your mentor or your uh, co surgeon is using the laser, you can. Uh, damage the uh, the uh, reusable uh, flexible uh, ureteroscope. So in some situations, it's very useful to use the single user ureteroscope because you don't mind if uh, uh, you have uh, a breakage of the single use ureteroscope. So in conclusion, uh, calcified stent is always is always a challenge. We have to work in safety. We have to never force, and we have to remember that uh, laser can cut everything, and uh, it's better to pull the stent out from the percutaneous axis whenever possible. And uh, um, it would be uh, advisable to keep the urethra stent uh, register. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, Dr. Proietti, excellent presentation, very interesting case and, and complex case. I mean, um, Ignacio? You. Yes, okay, well, congratulations, Silvia. Really nice, really nice uh, case or nightmare, I would say. Uh, <laughs> I, have, I have a question. There's a lot of legal, legal aspect regarding these cases, usually, huh. you know. So, you, 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 in the conclusion, you say to, to keep the the, the register of this patient. So, what, what's your protocol when you put a stent uh, in a patient? Do you have any protocol to, to follow up them and, and to avoid this, these scenarios? So, honestly speaking, uh, we don't have the register uh, of uh, the patient uh, with double J stent in place, uh, but anyway, we uh, we give uh, to the patient the appointments uh, for the uh, removal of the double J stent. Uh, so when uh, we discharge the patient, the patient uh, 
uh, have already the appointments uh, for the removal. Of course, uh, um, uh, it would be better to have the register, but uh, uh, in our institution, uh, to be honest, we don't have it. And I know that uh, one company has uh, a, um, an app uh, in uh, our iPhone or anyway in our cellular, and uh, they send uh, the message, the text uh, to the patient for uh, reminding them uh, uh, to remove uh, the double J stent because otherwise you can have uh, this very challenging scenario uh, in front of you when uh, the patient uh, uh, comes to your attention. But what, uh, what uh, was uh, really surprising, uh, the first guy was completely asymptomatic uh, with, the, with the double J stent, completely calcified after 10 years, after 10 years. So, so it's very sur surprising, but uh, it was like this. And sometimes uh, people uh, have uh, really uh, important symptoms just for the placement of the double J stent after uh, one week or two weeks. Uh, and uh, so we have to keep in mind that uh, also the symptoms are different uh, in, uh, in, in the patients. And they okay. forgot to have the double J stent inside because they are symptomatic. Do you have a um, Cesare, the, the register for your patients? Um. No, no, we don't have, but uh, we are uh, we are giving to the patient uh, immediately the the appointment for the removal. Now I am uh, I uh, I put uh, my uh, double J uh, for 80% of the flexible ureteroscopy for three four days maximum. So there are very few patients uh, who maintain uh, the double J uh, for uh, for one month. We have uh, we have some patients in the WCA every three, four months uh, or six months, uh, but normally after a, a surgical procedure, we maintain uh, the WJ only if uh, we have a ureteral lesion. So normally after a PNL, we put a pyelostomy, the WJ with the catheter, first post-operative day, we remove the pyelostomy, and second or third post-operative day, we remove WJ and the catheter. And the same also for ureteroscopy, we we made the ureteroscopy and the first post-operative day, patient uh, go, goes at home and uh, remove the, the, the double J with the string uh, four, five, six days after. Because uh, as uh, Sylvia told before, double J is uh, really, really uh, painful for the patient, especially in some, some patient is, uh, is not tolerable. And uh, so I, I try to maintain uh, less time that I can. And I want to underline uh, one uh, very important aspect of the two surgeries uh, that uh, Sylvia uh, showed before, because uh, it's very important to check uh, all the double J. Because uh, if you try to pull out uh, the double J, the completely calcified double J, do you imagine that you have only this uh, calcification? These are these are two very particular cases. But even if you have a double J after three months, uh, before if you if you try to remove the double J and you have some uh, some uh, traction or something, you have to stop. And the best is to go up uh, and to decide if uh, you you have to do the the, the double access uh, or you have to you can do also in your arthroscopy. But sometimes it's not so easy to pass uh, just uh, beside the double J. So it's very important to check with the ureteroscope before before uh, try to, to pull out the double J. Yeah, absolutely agree. Silvia, we have some questions for the, from the audience. Uh, Dr. Jose Aguilar Moreno is asking if you put a double J stent after this procedure and if you leave it attached with a, with a string on the distal part. So after this particular case, uh, uh, so uh, in the first case, uh, it was a little bit different because uh, we perform also some lithotripsy, also the other stones. So we operate uh, 
uh, five, six uh, times this poor guy in one side and then the other side. And uh, but uh, in the second case, uh, we didn't leave uh, any uh, double jet stent in place, considering that the uh, the patient was lost to the follow up and the ureter was really compliant. So in um, in that particular case, uh, we didn't leave uh, uh, we didn't uh, we didn't leave uh, any double jet stent in place on the left side. And then uh, we perform uh, uh, in the other side another procedure in the sec in uh, second stage. Uh, anyway, uh, in uh, uh, in my opinion, as Cesare told you, uh, it, in, uh, the best way to manage the double J double J stand placement uh, is to uh, to leave the uh, the double J stand. Uh, um three four days uh, after an eventful procedure and uh, we leave uh, also the strings whenever possible uh, in uh, our patient so for pcnl cases uh, we didn't uh, place the uh, we don't place the uh, nephrostomy and we in 80 percent of cases i would say and uh, we leave just the double j stent for 10 k uh, for 10 days so I think, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, Not so uh, Dr. Schettino, do you have any comment about alkalinicized during in this patient to maybe make the surgery less complicated? So, um, uh, for the uric acid stone, maybe the alkalinization uh, uh, was one possibility, but uh, if you remind about the calcification of the double J stent was uh, uh, calcium uh, um, oxalate monohydrate. So the alkalinization, of course, uh, didn't work. So, in my opinion, when you have a complex case like this, it's better not to alkalinize the patient, also because the risk of infection is very high after four years with the double J stent in place. So, we decide to perform the surgery directly. Okay, so you, you mentioned the, the, infect, the infection issues. So, do you have any, any special Special um, careful with this patient with the, or, or any protocolized any um, uh, antibiotic strategy different to any other cases or just you do the the strategy you do uh, with the, any other patient. So we have the same strategy for the other patient, of course. So we perform a urine culture before the surgery, and according to the antibiogram, uh, we perform uh, the antibiotic therapy uh, some days before. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, in this particular case with the calcified stent, uh, anyway, we carry on with the, the antibiotic also after the surgery. Uh, in the other case, uh, we use just a single dose of uh, cephalosporin uh, of second generation according to the EIU guidelines. Okay. And uh, do you consider uh, doing this kind of, of surgery in stages or you, you go uh, all the way? Uh, what's your strategy in that matter? You, you, you try to, to take the stent on all the... Uh, the stones you can, or maybe leave the, the the renal part for a second time. What 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 are your thoughts about that? So of course, in the first case, it was not possible to render the, the patient stone free uh, just uh, also in the left side. Uh, but uh, in the second case, it was possible, and I would say the situation was easier than the first case that I show you. And uh, it was possible to render the patient on the left side uh, stone free. And of course, uh, if the situation is very challenging and uh, you, um, the, situ and the uh, lithotripsy takes uh, two hours, three hours just to remove the stent, of course, uh, you have to consider this in the situation. And uh, uh, of course, you have to do your best to. Uh, to remove as much as possible of the, uh, the stones that are present in the kidney. But uh, you have to uh, consider every situation uh, in uh, every patient. Okay, so uh, is 
If there are not any other considerations, maybe we can move on to the next case. I don't know the, the other panelists if has some questions. Not more questions for the audience, so we can move on, Silvia. Do you agree? Okay. Yeah, perfect. So this case uh, is a 60 years male with bilateral stones, one centimeter stone. Um, uh, oh, sorry, one centimeter stone on the uh, right side and multiple lower calyx renal stones on the left side. He underwent previous unsuccessful right flexible ureteroscopy in another hospital for uncompliant ureter. So it came to our attention with also the right double J stent in place. This is the... Um, Sorry, I have a problem. Okay, this is the CT scan of this patient. So on the right side, uh, there is a, a small stone, and uh, on the left side, there are uh, uh, multiple stones, as I told you before. Uh, and um, in our opinion, this is a perfect case without uh, UTIs. This patient, it, it is a perfect. Uh, patient for uh, SBIS, so uh, simultaneous bilateral endoscopic surgery. So just to okay, uh, just to uh, tell you that uh, uh, for the bilateral same ses session procedure, the major concern for potential and hypothetical acute renal failure due to the manipulation of, of both renal units and supposed possibility of higher complication driving a surgeon choice towards stage procedure. But uh, I want just to, um, to show you the different terminology because uh, there is a little uh, bit of confusion in the literature. So stage bilateral surgery means that one side is performed first and then a delay second surgery. And bilateral single session procedure, the second side is approached during the same operation just after an eventful procedure on the first side. And the bilateral simultaneous procedure means that both sides are treated at the same time by two different surgeons who operate in tandem. So if you look at the literature, we, uh, we have uh, some uh, papers with, the, uh, with simultaneous uh, bilateral uh, surgery, but uh, if, you, if you look at the, um, uh, the paper, the manuscript, uh, they are not uh, real simultaneous. So the first simultaneous surgery is, uh, a, surgery, is uh, a flexible ureteroscopy on both sides, uh, on both both sides uh, uh, simultaneously uh, described by this group. And then uh, we uh, perform uh, the first SBIS. Uh, we created this acronym, uh, acronym for this technique uh, um, that we published just uh, a, a, like a case report in Urology uh, Gold Journal. And then uh, we published the first seri uh, series uh, of uh, SBIS uh, on uh, Surgery Motion, our European uh, Urology Journal, uh, about uh, 27 cases. So uh, just to, to show you the uh, SBIS or our setup, uh, I cannot tell you that uh, is n it is a, a very easy setup, uh, but if uh, you have uh, a very good team. Um, uh, it could be it, it could be easier than you think, and uh, of course you need two towers. But if you use the single user ureteroscope, uh, you have uh, the uh, the monitor of the single use flexible ureteroscope, uh, and maybe it is easier to manage uh, to manage the situation in your OR. Um, we need uh, two surgeons, as I told you before, and if you perform uh, flexible ureteroscopy and uh, mini PCNL uh, simultaneously, you need uh, two laser machines. 
So uh, we perform uh, uh, the SBIS uh, according to our position. We call uh, uh, Valdivia modified, Valdivia Galdacao modified justice position. We publish in this paper. You see that we use the swimming noodle just to rotate a little bit, uh, just to have a mild rotation of our patient. We place this swimming noodle along below the, uh, the flank of the patient. Uh, of the PCNL side and the leg of the patient, the PCNL side, is just uh, straight and the other one is on the stirrup. Uh, so we prefer to have the, uh, the leg of the PCNL side just uh, uh, straight because uh, we don't have any conflict uh, with the stirrup uh, uh, and the nephroscope. So we start uh, with the cystoscope uh, and we place uh, bo uh, both guide wires in the, in, into the kidneys. And then uh, uh, I place the occlusion balloon on the PCNL side and then the, the ureter access sheet on the flexible ureteroscope side. And then uh, um, in this particular video, I used the single use ureteroscope. Uh, to be honest, it was a very, um, uh, it was uh, in, uh, one of the first uh, video on the SBIS, but uh, honestly now, we check the 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 ureter with the ureter. I check the ureter with the ureteroscope uh, in um, uh, in order to be sure that there are no uh, stones in the ureter. And then I place the ureter axis sheet. Uh, as you can see, in the meantime, while I was performing the lithotripsy into the kidney, again it was a uric acid stone. Um, uh, my mentor, Dr. Giusti, was uh, performing the access uh, and uh, is, uh, um, uh, is uh, uh, placing the guide wire inside the kidney. And then, uh, as I showed you before, we place the balloon, uh, the balloon and then the amplus sheet inside the kidney. So um, I carry on with the, uh, the lithotripsy on the, uh, on the other side without any problem. Of course, if you have uh, any problem uh, in one side, you have to stop it immediately. And uh, um, you see uh, the uh, X-ray machine uh, was uh, uh, used by uh, Guido, who was performing the access uh, into the kidney, and then uh, he entered inside the kidney, he found the stones, and then uh, from now on, uh, we, uh, we started to perform lithotripsy simultaneously. And uh, so, um, uh, you can see he used the uh, the lithotrips uh, the lithotripter and then uh, uh, and then he remove by using the grasper anyway just to show you that uh, with the lithoviews monitor or whatever you want or with the single use uh, um, ureteroscope you can make uh, easier dor than uh, you think and uh, so you can see that we remove the uh, the stones, and then uh, we finish the um, um, we finish the the procedure just placing the double J stent uh, bilaterally. We check, of course, the the ureter and also the uh, the tract of the uh, of the percutaneous access. Uh, we finish. Uh, Sorry, the PCNL by using the uh, by using the flexible nephroscope, but uh, uh, whenever you want, you can use also the flexible ureteroscope also on the PCNL side, and you can perform a combined approach whenever you want. If there are some pieces in uh, a calyx when where you can not reach by using the flexible nephroscope. As I told you, I checked the, uh, the ureter and then I placed the double J stent bilateral and the bladder catheter. So uh, there are uh, the results that we publish in this paper and we didn't experience a major complication. Uh, what is important also that we didn't experience any 
acute renal failure in these 27 patients. And of course, we, are, we have some advantages uh, when we perform SVIS, we have a reduction of the operative and anesthesia time, and uh, also the patient's morbidity. We have a reduced overall, overall operative time and also OR occupation compared to a single session bilateral procedure and obviously to stage surgery cost savings uh, due to reduce cumul cumulative uh, hospital stay, room and anesthesia time, appropriate and post-operative workup, and also we have a reduced time to return to work. But of course, we have also disadvantage disadvantages. We need a complete and double equipment uh, uh, that uh, it should be available together with three doctors uh, in the OR. And uh, a question could be increased complication rates and potential risk of anuria. To be honest, we perform until now 50, around 50 cases of SVIS. We, didn't, we did not experience any major complication uh, in this uh, subset of patients uh, where we perform uh, SVIS. And uh, SBIS, uh, to be honest, is not fully remunerative for the hospital due to limitation in the cutting system for bilateral surgery. Second procedure, procedure is paid only 50%. So in conclusion, our manager is thinking next SBIS will fire Dr. Juice and Dr. Proietti, but what is important in our opinion is also uh, to do our best for our patients. So, in conclusion, SBIS is safe, effective, with minimal morbidity. SBIS had the potential advantages of shorter operative time, reduce, reduce anesthesia, and reduce hospital time, which can benefit patients, surgeons, and healthcare system. But we have to select uh, uh, very carefully our patient for SBAS and ideal candidates to SBAS are patients bearing bilateral small to medium sized stones who have a high chance to become stone free and to unlikely to undergo a second surgery, no UTIs and of course motivated and informed patients. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Silvia. Excellent presentation, excellent case. Um, Dr. Ignacio, do you have any questions? The audience? Okay, no, we don't have questions for the, for the old, old, uh, audience so far. Uh, yes, really interesting. I, I think uh, the, the main limitation to this is not maybe, maybe medical. Is as, as Silvia said here in Argentina, we have the same problem. Second procedure is is underpaid or, or paid 50 percent so i i think that's maybe the main um, problem with this approach uh, but i think that if you can perform it it's it's a really nice alternative it's better for the patient only one surgery so uh congratulations thank you so much so you are perfectly right in ignacio for the remuneration is not um, is not the best thing for the hospital, but in our opinion, we have to do our best. Of course, you have, as I told you before, you have to select very carefully uh, the patients because, of course, uh, for example, you cannot perform SVIS in the first two cases that I show you. And uh, you have to, uh, first of all, uh, you have to select patients without uh, recurrent UTIs because the risk of in postoperative infective complications are very high. And also the, the patient should be very, very motivated. You have to, uh, to talk with, the, uh, to speak with the patients and you have to explain the procedure and uh, also you have to choose uh, uh, no very difficult case, uh, cases. And as I told you before, the, the chance to render the patient stone free is very high in, uh, uh, in both sides. Yes, okay. Well, thank you. I know, uh, Seth, do you have any comment? 
Navi Dog Nascot. Okay, so uh, maybe we can move on to the next case, Sylvia. Do you have okay. any, any yeah. other case? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 sorry. No. Uh, you can see my slides? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, sorry. Yes. So the fourth case uh, is uh, she is uh, 63 years female, BMI 29. She underwent uh, seven previous right flexible urethroscopy for the same stone in another hospital for uric acid renal stone. And she was still asymptomatic. She came to our attention with this uh, CT scan. So the, um, we found a very strange uh, uh, finding in the right kidney uh it was uh, like a stone but it was not just a stone i would say uh, it was like a piece of something uh, calcified uh, so our thoughts were uh, were about a piece of guide wire calcified during the previous uh, flexible urethroscopy but what is uh, strange that during flexible urethroscopy is, is very strange to lose uh, a so uh, long piece of uh, guide wire. So we decide to check before the flex with the flexible ureteroscopy inside the kidney. And Tatan, what we found, uh, it was a very long piece of guide wire completely calcified, and there, there was still a piece of stone inside the kidney. So, in our opinion, it was too big, uh, this piece of guide wire to be removed by using just flexible ureteroscopy. So what was good uh, was to check with the flexible ureteroscopy before, before uh, starting with the PCNL, because we have to keep in mind also the medical issue, the medical legal issue that there is behind this procedure, and uh, but anyway it was impossible to remove uh, this long piece of guide wire by using just the flexible urethroscopy so we decide to perform again cesare uh, a combined approach uh, endoscopic uh, combined approach and uh, um, so in uh, uh, as i told you before uh, it, uh, our patients are placed in this position and uh, um, so they are ready for both retrograde and percutaneous success. And uh, all our patients are uh, informed about the possibility and design a concept for flexible urethroscopy and PCNL. And uh, we have to keep in mind then, that endourology is never black or white, and we have to be ready to change the strategy along the way. So we perform a PCNL access. Uh, as you can see, um, the flexible ureteroscopy just in front of the nephroscope. And this is the view from the nephroscope of this uh, long piece of guide wire just calcify. And what is good uh, to perform a combined approach uh, um, by using uh, Nephro, uh, PCNL and uh, uh, flexible ureteroscopy, so ECIRS. That sometimes uh, when uh, you we uh, we remove uh, as uh, you saw before the with the grasper the piece of the guide wire, but one small piece was uh, missed. Uh, and we check just we found just with the flexible ureteroscope. So with the nephroscope, we were able to to find that this piece miss, and we remove uh, by using the grasper from the percutaneous axis, and also we remove from uh, the percutaneous axis uh, the other uh, stone that. Uh, uh, was uh, present uh, into the kidney. So, in conclusion, uh, we have to uh, to keep in mind that retain renal 
on foreign bodies present a challenge to both the endourologists and the patient as well. And can, can, it, they can present as an idus for infection or stone formation. And there are possible legal sequ uh, sequelae. And the goal should be to remove completely in single setting, in single session, uh, the uh, foreign body that uh, we have uh, in the kidney. So thank you so much for your attention. Oh, I still surprised by the case, uh, Silvia. Uh, very interesting case. Ignacio, is there any yes. question for the audience? Yes, uh, so as you said, Silvia, this, this may have a lot of legal implications. Uh, so how do you manage the information you give to the patient before and after the, the procedure regarding the, that maybe a, a mistake of, of uh, a colleague, maybe a neglect of a colleague. So how do you manage the information? What do you say to the patient before and, or after the, the surgery? So honestly speaking, in this uh, particular case, uh, it was already written uh, in the report of the CT scan that there was probably a foreign bodies inside the kidney. So in my opinion, we have to be very kind also with uh, our colleagues because uh, anyway, the, um, just the, the surgeon who does not operate uh, does not have uh, complications. So um, it's possible to have uh, any kind of com uh, complication in uh, our hands. So we have to be very kind. Of course, uh, we uh, told uh, to this patient the truth, but uh, she was was uh, uh, really um, uh, she were really nice and I think uh, there was there were not uh, uh, medical legal issue in these particular cases uh, a case uh, and uh, uh, what is important in my opinion as I told you before we have to solve completely the situation uh, in these patients uh, and to render the patient stone free uh, as well um, uh, because otherwise they have to undergo more uh, uh, surgeries in the future so we have to do our best to solve everything in one single session. Cesare, do you have experience with this particular yes. case? I have, I have some experience. The, the last one was two, two, two months ago because uh, uh, after after a urethroscopy, I, uh, I I saw I saw uh, one patient coming from another hospital, and I made a CT scan, made a CT scan, and on the CT scan the suspect to have a piece of double J remaining remaining in the in the inferior uh, calyx was uh, was clear, and uh, so uh, I explained. I think that uh, with the patient we have to 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 be always very clear uh, is a. Uh, in my in my opinion, we don't have to cover anything, not for 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 ourselves, for the colleagues, because if the patient think that you want to cover something, is finish uh, is finished the relationship between doctor and patient. So I think that if you explain, something could happen, okay. But I think that it's very important the message after this. If you remove the guide wire, you have to check the guide wire out. And you have to have all the guide wire out. If you have the guide wire completely, because I don't know, I don't know if this piece uh, is uh, really the guide wire. I think it's only the coating. The coating, the yeah, the coating. Uh, but what, the, what, what's what was strange, uh, Cesare, according also to your experience, that uh, the coating uh, uh, when you perform the PCNL in the needle. Uh, is uh, is more common to remove the co the coating from the guide wire. It was strange just after flexible ureteroscopy or not. Is uh, is also frequent uh, during flexible ureteroscopy, especially if you insert the guide wire with the contrast medium, because these are these are completely hydrophilic guide wire. If uh, you okay. don't have water, is sometimes uh, is very difficult, especially if you are using the rigid ureteroscope okay. and you, you pull out the guide wire and sometimes uh, 
you can't uh, see the the coating and the, but you have to check as exactly yeah. when you you remove a double j you have to do to 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 check the double j and you have to have the entire double j so i think that uh, this is really very important if you insert something inside you have to control after exactly. that everything is out it's like a gorge in the abdominal patient so and uh, and i think that many many sometimes uh, i have also one case that we perform a live surgery in spain with antonio frattini and we had the coating outside of the kidney during a, a hmm. Uh, a percutaneous access because uh, we try to remove the and uh, and the, the the needle was outside of the kidney so we leave uh, we leave a piece of guide wire outside the kidney it was impossible to remove but, but what do you, you think can, you can leave uh, it's no problem it does not matter no absolutely yeah. okay but I, I want I want only to uh, to tell something about the antibiotic therapy, the protocol, because uh, uh, we after after uh, uh, the first paper on the ECIRS, uh, in which we have 28% uh, um, of infection after this uh, complex PNL, we standardize our protocol and now we are doing for all the percutaneous surgery or complexed stone treatment also. For a uh, retrograde access, uh, we perform uh, the urine culture before. If uh, we have a urine culture positive, we treat before the surgery. But normally, if you have a stone or something or double J, it's difficult uh, to clean. So in this case, uh, we perform for three days uh, amikacin, uh, one grams for three days uh, with uh, cephalosporin of uh, second generation together. In this way, we decrease. Uh, this percentage to four or five percent, and uh, if uh, we have uh, uh, the suspect uh, of sepsis or something, we check the, the the patient just immediately after the the surgery. And uh, another another uh, thing that we are doing always is a urine culture before starting the lithotripsy. So we 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 keep we keep uh, the urine. In flexible ureteroscopy or, or from the needle in percutaneous surgery in order to have always one urine culture to use if something can happen after the surgery. Cesare, do you perform stone culture? Not uh, not stone culture. I, I perform sometimes if I have this uh, sort of uh, bacteric film around the, the, the stone, I, I, I keep this urine just around the stone, but not the stone culture. In our hospital, it's not possible to perform stone culture, unfortunately. It's, anyway. it's not easy, it's very difficult to do. No, this. it's difficult, yeah. Ignacio? Sandro? Uh, Alessa, you have a question? No, no, it's uh, maybe two hours at uh, almost. Uh, Dr. Proietti, Cesare, excellent presentation. Thank you so much for for your time and patience. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Ignacio and Dr. Koya. Um, Alejo, did you? Yes, thank you, Cesare, and thank you, Silvia. Uh, mm -hmm. Just uh, record the, the audience. This Thursday, uh, 11 at 8 p.m. in Argentina, uh, will be the, the next chapter uh, with Marcelo Batistuzzi from Brazil, uh, flexible ureteroscopy, tips and tricks. Um, no, nah, nothing. Thank you, Silvia. Thank you, Cesare. Thank you thank so, you so much, much thank you. for your time. Thank you. Thank you for thank the invitation. You. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Bye, bye bye. Bye. Ciao, Cesare. Thank you. Oh, Silvia, Ciao. Ciao. Thank you so much.